Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to um, FAS uh, Fireside Chat 2 uh, on uh, building a uh, robust SMP capital for human, for economic recovery and resilience. And I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today uh, to uh, discuss this uh, all important um, overarching topic okay, that uh, has been the subject of uh, many uh, campaigns uh, through the decades. Okay? And um, well, uh, again, for a brief background, we have this chat today, and it's a burning issue. That's why it's a fireside chat. Uh, because uh, Chris and Marie Vic Bernido resurrected the topic with a, uh, a well written um, paper that they shared with us. And it um, elicited a lot of responses from our policy members. Okay, so among those who um, uh, responded to uh, them at great length with voluminous uh, ideas, suggestions of Joel Quello. Uh, then there's, um, uh, well, Al Sarapica. Esther Garcia traced the history of SF from, um, uh, well, the 80s. And then uh, we had Arnel Salvador with Greg Tangona, Toby Dairi, and uh, a few others in Pase, and Salpena, our vice president, also uh, gave comments. So we thought that the first thing we should do uh, is to consult our uh, wise uh, academic leaders, uh, wisdom gained from um, great experience leading our institutions, our academic and R&D institutions. So uh, today, uh, on uh, behalf of my co-host and moderator, Sifu David, we are um, honored and grateful that we have five speakers to share their views, their thoughts on guide questions uh, we prepared. Either general guide questions, but we also prepared a uh, table of implementable actions already based on what our PASA members had uh, shared with us. Our five um, speakers are Secretary Ernie Pernia and our four honorary members. And I will now pass on um, the floor to CP, who will introduce them properly. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thanks, Mom Giselle. As uh, you have mentioned, we have the, the most distinguished list of speakers this morning, as well as our colleagues and friends who have contributed to the overall idea of putting up a paper on S&P human capital development. Quick question, Mom Giselle, because uh, one of our speakers, Father Nebres, is coming in at 9 a.m. What would be our sequence of uh, presentations? Again, we start with Dr. Pernia, followed by uh, N.S. Javier. And, Dr. Javier. And then Dr. Javier. Dr. Pa Dr. Padolina. Yes, and then Dr. And Pascual. Dr. Pascual and then yes. Pascal Nebres. Yeah, and then if it's not in yet, then Q&A first. Okay? Yeah. Then okay, we got it. Okay. okay. Thank you. So thank you again for joining our fireside chat this morning. Uh, it's a matter of uh, second introduction, but Mom Giselle already mentioned some of the key points that we want to tackle this morning. The way a nation develops its human capital actually defines the economic strategy the country will choose. Now, our strategy as a country has been at most I would say an opportunistic one, mainly relying on the demand coming from overseas. We've seen the increase in interest in school teachers when there was that demand, uh, construction workers, then nursing, and then lately uh, demand in the maritime industry. 
the S&T human capital development is nowhere to be found. Uh, all I know is that we, uh, as part of the S&T sector, need to have a clear path uh, in terms of developing human capital towards employment and towards economic recovery of the country. We'll start with a short lecture, a 10 minute lecture from Dr. Ernie Pernia, who is a professor of economics and former director general of NEDA. Dr. Pernia, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, just to refer again to uh, Chris and Marivik's paper. In fact, I was the first one to comment. And what I said was, we should disseminate this widely, publicize it, but it has to be made more catchy in terms of the, of the title of it, and also made the, uh, the text should be made a little bit more uh, legible, understandable to the general public, because it's really a very provocative paper. Anyway, this is, uh, this is about human capital development. And I think uh, you'll agree with me that ideally, human capital development should, should, be, should be viewed as a life cycle ecosystem. We cannot just uh, you know, start injecting uh, human capital at the PhD level or, or at the master's level. We have really to start from the, from the beginning. And uh, one of our major problems is the stunted children. And that's a, that is why early child development is very important because uh, these are the feeders. We start with children as feeders uh, on uh, going up the school ladder, basic education, higher education, and then uh, postgraduate. So that, that would be the ideal way to, to look at it. And uh, um, Esther Garcia earlier said that uh, we should just focus on a few items and I agree with her. And uh, instead of uh, redoing papers again, over and over again, I would like to just uh, hark back to the Philippine Development Plan 2017 to 2022, where human capital development is one of the central chapters and also uh, human capital development and uh, the, eco the economist growth potential so that uh, eventually we will be a globally competitive knowledge economy. So uh, just, to, uh, just to put in a very short uh, phrase, the objective of the Philippine Development Plan, it is uh, laying the foundation for inclusive development towards a high trust and cohesive, high trust, cohesive, and a globally competitive knowledge economy. So the, the, the question is how to, how to achieve, how to move towards this goal. And I think the, the, the answer would be to ramp up investment in human capital a new, uh, with a human capital development fund because uh, we need a lot of funds to invest in human capital. As I've said, starting from early childhood uh, through uh, graduate school. And uh, this human capital development plan, of course, uh, has to be initiated by the government, but the government cannot do it alone, as has been uh, demonstrated uh, with the kind of budget the DOST is getting only about, uh, for R&D, it's only about 0.15% of GDP. And uh, so this human capital, human development fund should be uh, enhanced with uh, contributions from the private sector businesses. And these contributions from the private sector businesses can, see in, can be incentivized by making them tax deductible meaning uh, uh, those who contribute to the capital development fund, human capital development plan, plan will be getting tax deductions. That's a, that's a very, uh, that's a very uh, uh, you know, attractive uh, 
incentive for them. So if we go to the uh, Philippine Development Plan, in terms of the strategies, what the strategies uh, need, uh, we need to achieve this uh, goal that I mentioned earlier, uh, the strategies are, you know, we have uh, seven parts in the Philippine Development Plan, four of which are relevant to what we are going to be talking about. In part two, we are Part two talks about enhancing the social fabric, meaning strengthen solidarity, social solidarity. And uh, there's a chapter there in this part uh, two, which talks about ensuring people-centered, clean and efficient governance, and uh, also promoting Philippine culture and values. And then in part three, Part three talks about inequality reducing transformation. And in uh, under this part three is chapter 10, accelerating human capital development. That's exactly what we are, that this is exactly the main point of this uh, fireside, fireside chat. But then we also need uh, part four, which is increasing the economy's growth potential. And for this, we have chapter 14, vigorously advancing science, science and technology and innovation. And then in part six, uh, part six is about foundations for sustainable development. And uh, there, there is uh, chapter 19, accelerating infrastructure development. And then chapter 20, ensuring ecological integrity, clean and healthy environment. I think uh, these, are, these are really just some major themes or sub themes toward uh, human capital development. And I think the table uh, provided by Giselle provides the very detailed, uh, very detailed instruments to you know, uh, each of these uh, sub themes. So that's all. That's about 10 minutes, I think. I consume 10 <laughs> minutes uh, uh, CP. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Pernia. I have a couple of questions I wrote down already for you, but I'll wait for the Q&A to, sure. to get these uh, questions. Thank you, Dr. Pernia. Let's move on um, so that we can cover more topics uh, in a quicker manner. Our next speaker, obviously, again, needs no introduction, but he is a professor in plant genetics and former president of UP from 1993 to 1999. Let's please welcome national scientist, Emil Q. Javier. The floor is yours, sir. Okay, unmute. Sorry, sorry. Good morning, uh, fellow members of PAASE, of NAS, <clears throat> uh, from academe, students, uh, and friends. As uh, started by Kenny uh, Pernia, the matter of building a human capital in s and is a complex uh, undertaking, and really it's an ecosystem with so many moving parts and so many people involved. Starting with the basic education to undergraduate and graduate education, and finally, innovation and commercialization of, uh, of uh, technologies uh, by industry. This morning, the, the 10 minutes I'm given, I will devote to addressing the second question guide question posed by Gisela to, to us. Uh, let me uh, read this uh, particular uh, guide question as posed by <clears throat> Gisela. Governments typically are the catalyst in creating demand for enabling industries with high intellectual capital. So what are the concrete strategies that we may adopt to achieve this? 
my proposal is not a new one because it's, uh, I think, a common knowledge. But the idea is, I think, among many others that we should do, we should adapt as a organizational strategy the establishment of uh, mission-oriented multidisciplinary research centers in our universities. Uh, this is a common model in the US with the establishment of SMP parks in the university campuses. And among the best examples is the, the initiative of Frederick Thurman in Stanford, an electrical engineer who was the mover in establishing an SMP park in Stanford, inviting uh, industries to locate therein. And this effort by Thurman really gave birth to the Silicon Valley uh, concept. Uh, there are two elements here, uh, mission-oriented and in the university. Because after all, to get public support from Congress, we have to relate those items of expenditures to the public good. And therefore, while it's very tempting to propose, say, the basic sciences as uh, uh, rightful and eligible uh, targets of public support, we will be better off we we present ourselves as uh, uh, people with a mission, uh, with the intent of contributing to the statement of national uh, uh, purposes. Okay, <clears throat> sorry. So the, the, the concept is the, what the term called the steeples of academic excellence. Uh, steeples of excellence meaning uh, narrow heights, uh, towers, but not ivory towers as explained by the 11th president of Stanford, uh, Mark Leisher Levin, Stanford is a purposeful university. Therefore, this, uh, these steeples of excellence in the university in Stanford uh, promote and celebrate academic excellence, not as an end by itself, but as a means of further multiplying the benefits of, of its activities for, for society. This notion of mission-oriented uh, centers in the university is not, it's not new. We had a number of them uh, before, but I think we, we could take, uh, we should uh, revisit them. A quick look at our SNT horizon will show that, in fact, among the fields of science, agriculture, in relative terms, have received more public support over the years compared with the others. Uh, in fact, <clears throat> the, the surge of investments in higher education and research in agriculture occurred in the 1970s after the declaration of martial law with the establishment of UPLB, uh, Picard, Mariano Marcos State University, Central Luzon State University, Visca, uh, Central Mindanao, USM, and the component institutes therein like IPB, uh, National Crop Protection Center, uh, Food Science Institute, Post Harvest uh, Technology Center, and, and so forth and so on. So in the 70s, there was a flash of investments by government. Uh, because it had, uh, at that time, no less than President Marcos himself was interested in science and in agriculture in particular, 
And of course, he had a uh, very aggressive secretary of agriculture by his, by his side, uh, Arturo Tango. So over the years, we have established these uh, uh, centers, many of which are uh, still functioning, although many have uh, lost steam or lost ground uh, after uh, support for them uh, dried up when our economy they took a tailspin in the early 80s, which led to the uh, and so, of course, the assassination of, uh, of uh, Benigno Aquino. Uh, in, in Diliman, we have the Marine Science Institute, the National Institute of Physics, National Institute of Geology. Uh, these institutions have, have flourished in spite of the fact of relative ne neglect. So what remains now is for us to persuade Congress to really adopt a uh, aggressive measure to uh, and, uh, expand support for these established centers of excellence in the university. Not, not only in UP, but in private universities uh, uh, as well. But the problem of uh, linking supply and demand must be addressed. Uh, because even with these agricultural institutes that have been established, some of which are still flourishing today, the weakness had been up to this point is the lack of, of uh, linkage with the private sector. And therefore, the, the Thurman model of, uh, of uh, steeples of excellence, where you invite the private sector to to locate on the university councils is uh, very, very valid. So my proposal is that among the measures that we are contemplating, I think we should push for a very deliberate, aggressive uh, effort from Congress to support those centers of excellence in the universities, both uh, public and, and private, as a means of of uh, really ramping up our uh, human capital uh, investment. At the same time, making sure that that, that that supply is linked with, effectively linked with demand by uh, this, uh, the, the stands for the model of uh, Thurman. So I think uh, uh, in that way, then uh, we can, can really uh, focus our efforts in, in certain institutions that will uh, lead in, in, the, in our effort for human uh, capital development. But this necessarily uh, requires some degree of prioritization, as, uh, as Esther Garcia was mentioning earlier, because that the problem with this concept of center of excellence, which was started by UP, was adopted by CHED. But CHED now has more than 300 centers of excellence. And therefore, it's inconceivable that we will have enough money to support all those 300 centers of excellence. In 1983, in my capacity as a minister at that time, I called the attention of Marcos so the number of uh, research institutions that have been established for agriculture. I showed him uh, a bar graph with so many institutes for agriculture. And now the health, uh, the health centers of Imelda. But I cited that there was only one for basic sciences, sciences NSRC in Diliman. And so he asked me, what do you do? Then that's led to the uh, Sign uh, signing of EO889, the establishment of basic sciences in, uh, in UP, which recognized the Department of Physics and elevated it to a national institute, as well as NIGS, NSRI, and the uh, institutes in Los Baños. They received substantial infusion of grants at the beginning, but uh, later on, the, the uh, support waned. But I think we could revisit those efforts because after, after all these years, even with uh, very relatively moderate support, 
NIP, NIGS, and these institutions, including the Marine Science Institute, have proven that they can be worthy uh, 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 targets for uh, public support. So the, my idea is for us to adopt a uh, dedicated effort to stop this mission-oriented uh, multidisciplinary centers in the universities as a way of augmenting supply, but with the model of uh, Silicon Valley, Stanford, relocating the uh, private industry in the campuses to link these uh, university centers of excellence with the needs of the private sector. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Javier. So, so far for those who have uh, just uh, recently joined our fireside chat, we've heard from Dr. Pernia about looking at human capital development by looking at, looking at it uh, as part of a life cycle ecosystem, essentially looking at the supply side of s and workers in the country. And then from Dr. Javier, um, he mentioned mainly the purpose of why we need to develop s and workers. Um, and, and that is at least for one uh, strategy for us to be able to innovate and commercialize s and research. And by linking the, the work done by s and workers to the private sector. Um, and, and so this will create that demand and hopefully break the chicken and egg a problem of not having enough supply because there's no demand just yet. Uh, I see what Dr. Javier is saying, and that is that our universities need to transform in a way of being simply an academic institution as a training ground for uh, the next generation professionals, but also like what UP is doing, do more research and extension work even at the university level and ensure that uh, we're not just teaching the next generation but also contributing uh, already in the knowledge gap that is required for our industries to further develop. So, so far we've heard uh, two very short and uh, very crisp presentations. We'll move on to our third presenter this morning Dr. Willy Padolina was a professor of biotechnology in UPLB and was, of course, former DOST secretary. So please welcome academician Dr. William Padolina. The floor Thank, is you. <coughs> Thank you, CP, and good morning to you all. Uh, I don't know what else to add after listening to Secretary Peña and uh, Pernia and uh, President Javier. But I'd like to just share a few thoughts about what, what I think are very vital in points to really consider. First is, I don't think there is any country in the world that can claim to have adequate numbers of s &T workers. And I'm saying that because you know, for example, even some of our PAASE members are there in U.S. or in other parts of the world because they have been able to really compete in the market. So what I'm saying is that maybe human development and retention programs must be competitive. We must compete in the market because otherwise we will continue to experience what I think is a market failure. Secondly, as Dr. Javier has mentioned, support in s and is reversible. And it may be due to political circumstances or even the outputs of what he called the centers of excellence. There is obsolescence in human capital. And uh, unless we replenish our workforce, our knowledge workers, this obsolescence can be a factor in our failure to respond to our societal interests. So um, 
what let me let me uh, just reiterate what i said human capital development and retention must be uh, viewed in terms of a market and that we must establish schemes that will make us competitive because we will have to attract people here and part of it may be niching selecting priority areas where we think we will excel and that we can be considered one of the leading lights in that particular area in the global market it's a global market and unless we really awaken to that i think it's going to be very difficult to get back our uh what we call our 1950s uh stellar performance in fact uh if you've read the uh, uh uh, study by Yoshihara Kunio, he calls our development as technology less. It's technology less industrialization. So, what do I propose? Let's go to the jugular. I think we might want to study the Thousand Talents program of China because what we have to really get back are talents whether they are Filipinos or foreigners, we, we will need them. The problems are piling up. And inequality is becoming more and more intense because we are unable to address these problems because of a very limited talent force. I think all of us here will agree that um, even if you ask for, for um, proposals, you will probably get the proposals from the same persons who have already been successful in, in getting grants. Because the pool is just too narrow and too small. And what is the consequence? We are overburdened. And when you're overburdened, then, you know, the something will have to give way. It's either problems that are important will not be addressed because you have to attend to one. For example, Boracay, we have more than one very, very nice tourist spots which are already deteriorating, but we're not able to address them because we don't have enough people. We can only address Boracay and then move to the next. By the time we move to the, the nth spot, it's already deteriorated and irreversible. We don't want that to happen. So um, let's go to the jugular. Let's get people in because they are the ones that will provide the brain power to solve our problems, whether they be in private sector or whether they be in agriculture or manufacturing, let's get them in because otherwise, the problems will really deteriorate to a degree where we will just all have to suffer. And I'm afraid we are seeing that already in the current pandemic. And unless we awaken to that reality, we will find it um, uh, very, very difficult. We do have many um, areas where we could excel in my view there are many areas where we can excel we just have to prioritize them we have some areas where we have a critical mass of talents but many others we are short of uh, of talents uh, for example in the in the area of microbiology there are only eight uh, heis offering this program and now you can see how we are approaching the pandemic, which is caused by a micro. <laughs> um, fundamental um, uh, knowledge is not there. Uh, and maybe last point is that uh, we need to attend to our national defense. Um, I don't know how our academics will take it. There are people in our universities who do not want to engage in military research. 
Um, but I think we have reached a point where we can no longer depend on visiting forces agreement, et cetera, et cetera, that we have to brace up ourselves in terms of having this uh, cap capacity. And unfortunately, some of the programs started earlier during the time of uh, martial law were not continued. Um, I refer to Project Santa Barbara, which would have really pushed us a little bit higher into the national defense uh, scale. And also the reduction of the budget of the AFP R&D Center. Uh, I have been told that even our combat rations are imported. And that is a shame. I mean, why can't we put that together? Anyway, uh, just back to my point, and let's go to the jugular. Let's bring people in to help solve our problems. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Padalina. I'll come back to you on some of the some of the points that you you mentioned. For example, national defense research funding uh, and selecting priority areas, and, and so we'll revisit these topics during the Q and A. Thank you again. Moving on to our fourth speaker, Dr. Pasqual is the president of the Institute of Corporate Directors and was the immediate past president of UP. Please welcome former President Alfredo Pascual. The floor is yours, sir. Good morning. I think we've got a uh, broad perspective that has been shared with us by uh, Ernie initially when he talks about the life cycle approach to human capital development and the existence of a development strategy over the medium term and the long term. Uh, we've also heard about uh, other uh, ideas from President Emil and from uh, Willie, the idea of uh, centers of excellence or R&D institutes that are closely linked to universities and uh, industry at the same time. And uh, the idea of competitiveness. I, I'd like to share a few thoughts on some of this and, and, and uh, add something uh, from my own uh, appreciation of the situation. Uh, I've always, I agree with the idea that we need competitiveness. I always believe that it's competitiveness that brings out the best in uh, people. Now, with respect to uh, bringing in experts, in the knowledge paper that we prepared when I was towards the tail end of my uh, administration in UP, we, we said that we should uh, bring in experts starting with our own Filipino scientists and uh, technology experts now based abroad and they could be attracted back and that we should send uh, selected uh, highly qualified people to go for advanced education in the US. But while we're, we're waiting to the return of uh, people we send out for abroad uh, for training abroad, uh, we brought I injected the idea of uh, being open to bringing foreign experts to fill in the gap that uh, Willie was uh, uh, referring to. There are experts, we, we lack in-depth experts, you know, in uh, very imp important areas and one area has already been highlighted by, uh, by Willie. The other point I'd like to, to raise is, uh, no, we cannot talk of, uh, it has already been mentioned, you know, of uh, experts in s and uh, with, without broadening or uh, having a well-prepared base from which to draw the highly qualified 
experts. And I'm referring to uh, the quality of our basic education, uh, which has to be addressed first and foremost. When we talked of uh, su supporting industries, you know, technology and knowledge industries, uh, of course, we need the high experts, but there, uh, there has to be a supply of uh, technology workers as well. You know, and where will they come from? We have uh, very weak graduates from our basic education system, uh, starting from weak elementary schooling and, and weak high school. Uh, and, and many of them eventually end up and, uh, and uh, you know, unproductively occupy uh, seats in our colleges and universities. Uh, the, the, the problem with our country is uh, we're so oriented towards people eventually going to college. Uh, I thought we, we should have broken that uh, kind of uh, mindset when the senior high school uh, level of uh, basic education has been introduced, that it would be enough for people to get up to secondary education um, to be able to gain employment or to be able to uh, market a, uh, an expertise or a profession, uh, not profession in the white collar sense, you know, but uh, the, as technical workers. But uh, it's not coming out that way. When I was uh, still active in uh, industry, we, we tried to uh, promote the idea of uh, companies already uh, revising their job description and uh, not anymore requiring college education for certain jobs in, uh, in factories and in, in, in offices. Uh, but it's turning out that uh, the qualification is short, you know, the requirements coming from among the graduates coming from uh, senior high schools, for which we have uh, a few uh, graduates now. Uh, now, it's a question of money. How do we strengthen the basic education? I think we need to advise government to re-examine the move it made to grant so-called universal access to quality education. Unfortunately, it focused just on universal access, but there was no support for raising the quality of a tertiary education. I think that has to be terminated and with the money being committed to that uh, exercise, uh, the basic education uh, can can uh, get this money and and uh, this uh, and the quality and base for basic education eventually raised. The other syndrome that I have uh, observed, you know, having worked with government and with through you to being uh, in the administration of UP, is this idea of uh, X divided by N, uh, there is no selectivity at all in many of the things we do. Uh, it's very evident, for example, in the number of SUCs we have. And if Chad will not hold the line, you know, each congressional district will have an SUC. And uh, with that uh, proliferation of uh, public universities, the quality eventually suffers because the funding available will not be sufficient. Uh, I think there has to be uh, selectiveness in, in uh, getting people admitted to college. And then from among those in college, we identify the most highly qualified and they should be supported with the government funding for 
further studies, either here or abroad. And for, you know, that has been the, the approach in the past. Uh, remember when the first, when the Americans first came here, there was a dearth of uh, expertise. So they selected a few highly qualified people and sent them over to the U.S. for, for advanced studies. And when they came back, they became the, uh, the leaders in the country. I think something along that idea would be uh, helpful in addressing the shortage, shortage of talents and expertise in the now uh, emerging and challenging fields uh, in our uh, society. Now, the, again, the, uh, President uh, Emil referred to the proliferation of the uh, centers of excellence as recognized by Chad. Uh, this is, again, part of that syndrome, you know, of the lack of uh, selectiveness. Uh, I think the, there's so much political pressure to recognize centers, so-called centers of excellence, creating SUCs, okay? that uh, people or the officials who should be holding the line are not able to impose on the need uh, for being selective and the imposition of higher standards, you know, for recognition. Otherwise, we end up with so many so-called so SUCs, so many centers of uh, excellence, but they're not really contributing much to the needs for innovation and creativity in our country. So I think if we need to come up with an idea that we will have to promote, it is that idea that uh, there has to be selectiveness and that uh, necessarily there will be people who will be given more support because they're qualified and sorry for those who will not be even support because they have not met the mark or the standards. Uh, I've seen this very clearly, you know, like in this, when we were introducing the performance-based bonus in, in uh, the government, and in that particular case, uh, UP, there, was a, there were rallies, you know, and people were insisting on uh, whatever is the pie for bonus that should be divided equally among all the employees. No, that, that kind of mentality has to change. You know? uh, we need to be able to identify the highly qualified, develop them fully, and they will serve as the locomotive or locomotives, a few of them, that will pull the train of development in our country. Otherwise, we'll all be competing in a, in a downward spiral, you know, because resources are being depleted and wasted by allocating them to those who do not deserve support. Uh, we cannot develop the whole country at the same pace at the same time. We cannot develop universities. Uh, how many universities do we have? More than 3,000 or, or more, two, more than 2,000 universities, mostly private, but of course there are SUCs that are uh, also not developing very well because the budget is spread out, you know, over so many. So there has to be selectiveness, strengthen basic education, and that's where most people should uh, be going to, be selective in admission in college. If the private schools cannot be controlled fully, then SUCs, and, and uh, have, have to be controlled so that admission is limited. And, uh, but the quality should be raised, you know, to a level that is globally competitive and it should produce the required expertise we need. There is a need to focus. So selectiveness, focus, we have to focus on certain selected area, areas of expertise for which we need to develop. We cannot be experts in all scientific fields or in all technological fields. Uh, and that should be the approach. Selectiveness, focus, and recognizing 
uh, those that can be developed as locomotives that will pull the country towards progress. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So from Dr. Padolina and Dr. Pascual, we heard potential strategies that the country can take in terms of essentially achieving competitiveness in different sectors as well as in the global market. Uh, for Dr. Padolina, as well as uh, for, for Dr. Pascual, there is a need to select priority areas and we can talk about what these areas are. Uh, perhaps we can um, consider the fourth industrial revolution that is uh, already in our midst. Uh, we should also be talking about perhaps agriculture again and going back to our base uh, sector, economic sector. Uh, but uh, before we go to that, I wanted to discuss now with everybody and the advantage of having a smaller group like this is that we can really distill each and every topic you know, uh, with, with all members uh, of this Zoom meeting being able to contribute. I wanted first to, to, to go into one of the topics that um, actually Dr. Pasquale and Dr. Pernia mentioned, and that is developing our primary and secondary s and programs. Siguro yun muna. And, and uh, let's discuss that uh, in a bit more detail. But I should also mention that the planned fireside chat, the next one, will be all about this particular topic. And so if it's okay, I, may I call on Chris and Marivik to talk ab more about uh, your experience with developing a better s and program for our primary and secondary schools, knowing fully well that we're, we're educating millions and millions of people and a part of that education is making sure that they are encouraged to take on careers in s and in college. Dr. Bernita? Um, yeah, I, I, I actually want, yeah, okay. Uh, first of all, can I, I just, Ask a question before I answer your your question. Sure. Uh, I'd like, I would like to, I would like to, uh, I would like to take this opportunity since the two former science ministers are here with us uh, this morning. Uh, is Dr. Javier? Yeah. I, I wanted to ask them um, if, in their experience, while they were heading the the uh, DOST. Um, if there were occasions and how frequent uh, was this occasion of returning money from a given, uh, money given to DOST, which has to be returned to the national government at the end of the year. And uh, if this was done and probably how frequently and what would you think is the reason for that? Dr. Javier, do you remember during your time? when part of the budget of DOST uh, needed, wasn't actually utilized? I guess that was the question of uh, Chris, no? Of course not. No, the, well, the problem really is, the amounts are not really big. And also the problems emanates with the Congress and DBM. Uh, the problem now is the bulk of the money. Uh, before there were not much money, it was only after when VAT was passed uh, two years before the end of the GMA, when there was more money. But before that, all the agencies didn't have much money. But the problem now is there's money, but they will be releasing in October, November. How can you intelligently and, and uh, spend the money? And also, uh, because of these uh, problems with Napoles and all those uh, NGOs, Many of our uh, uh, technocrats have become gun shy. They are very particular on the uh, procurement, processing, uh, and auditing processes. And uh, they would not dare uh, take risks. 
And that's the explanation why there's so much money that are being returned now. But during our time, there was not much money anyway. And mm -hmm. the money was being released on time. Pero ngayon, maraming pera, but they are released in October, November. How can you really intelligently spend the money? Of course, the, the audit system has become uh, really, I, I don't know, the adjective. Too strict. Term. Yeah. Too strict. Y and the, the bureaucrats yeah. became gun shy. They would not take yeah. risk anymore. How about you, Dr. Padolina? What was your experience then? Um, you're muted, sir. Uh, Dr. Padolina. Sorry, sorry. I, I think we did. We, we did have occasions when we had to return money. And that's because the part of it would be even if we had calls for proposals, some would not fit the quality of proposals that we will we were willing we we were willing to fund. And second, of course, you have a very hyper-regulated uh, uh, environment, COA, DBM, etc., and all these restrictions that you know, by the time you are able to decide whether you complied with 10,000 different requirements, the year must already have been have passed, and therefore you have to return the un unused funds. Um, I think, if I may be asked, we need a separate set of guidelines for uh, financial management and accountability for R&D and, um, and, the, and the universities. If we are using public money for, and giving them to both private and public universities. The bottom line in my view is to empower the researchers. We need to empower the researchers. They, we, we need to in, increase their level of discretion because they need to have that elbow room for them to be able to exercise their creativity to the fullest. It's just like requiring an artist whom you commission with government funds to buy this kind of a paint to finish his work because it's the lowest cost of oil paint. You know, I don't see any difference between that creativity and of an artist and that of a scientist. Anyway, so, thank you. <laughs> so, so management, that's a management. Now, well, it's uh, the bureaucracy that's the, the problem. But to, to, to the point of uh, Dr. Javier, uh, it was all actually only during the second half of the Aquino administration, Noy Noy Aquino's administration, wherein DOST had a bigger jump in budget. And prior to that, there was uh, really not much to, to go around. TP, may, may I just... Uh... Yes, sir, yes, sir, very quickly. Yeah. In this regard, you know, uh, how COA has become dysfunctional when it comes to creativity in our research activities or the terms of uh, giving the way to our scientists. You know, take for example, UP has always, you know, during my time, the time I was there, we were getting significant amount of uh, funding from DOST and from other sources for R&D. And uh, there was one uh, or there are a few situations where the planned research has not turned out to be successful. And then COA is insisting to see in the report of the researchers those things that they have committed to, to produce. But it's a failure. So I always say that based on this experience and many others, the university doesn't look like a, the right place for innovation, you know. It has no, because of the dysfunction of uh, certain uh, government offices that, that are looking over the work of the university, like COVA, yes. for example, they don't know what, uh, what, uh, exper or what, what experiments are and what uh, research is, you know. And they're expecting, like uh, in any other activity, if there are uh, steps outlined in the proposal and there are expected results, they will hold you to those steps and to those results. So no leeway for uh, 
failure and no leeway for changes. Your, your points will be echoed by Giselle and Ino and Arnel about the issues of procurement. But before we go on, let me just- Excuse uh, me, excuse me, excuse me. May I add before we leave that? Okay, let, let, let me just welcome to our Zoom meeting, Father Ben Nebres. Hi, Father Ben. Thank you for joining us. I'll call on you to give your 10 minute uh, speech or lecture you know, after this uh, round of discussion. So I'll call on Dr. Javier and then go back quickly to Chris and Maribic. Go ahead, sir. This, the, the problem of uh, procurement of scientific uh, supplies and equipment was uh, partly solved in Los Baños when we established the Central Scientific Supply House, where uh, items, supplies, chemicals, which are, you know, which are commonly used. So that would constitute maybe 70 to 80% of the expenditures are really recurring uh, requirements. And so we had a Central Scientific Supply House. So all you have to do is go there and sign a, uh, uh, supply issue voucher, then you have it. Uh, but I don't know for what reason the university stopped doing that. So we have a central scientific supply house. We uh, procure uh, supplies uh, a quarter or two ahead in bulk at most favorable prices. But I don't know why for some reason the UP stopped that concept of central scientific supply house, which was established by my predecessor, uh, Bel Samonte in LB. But I don't know why uh, this was stopped by UP and why the other uh, government agencies are not adopting that. We are, we are actually trying to revisit and solve that problem. Uh, Dr. Al Serafika is actually at the forefront of fixing the procurement issue starting in UP. But uh, that's a whole new topic. Uh, and I wanted to go back to Chris and Marivik about human capital development at the primary and secondary level, which I am sure will also be echoed by Father Ben as being one of the main issues as to why our s and sector is not fully developed. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I, I, I would just, because I'm, I consider myself as a foot soldier. I'm out there in the trenches and I'll, I'll also say why a little later, but uh, before anything else, I would like to um, uh, link up with what Secretary Pernia mentioned. I, I like the term, the life cycle, because uh, for me, uh, people have always been talking about the weakness of our basic education, elementary to high school. And I have, being here 100% immersed, I have really seen the causes of the weakness, at least majority of them. And I think at this point, uh, since Giselle was mentioning, we should, and Joel was also, were mentioning, we should have some doable tasks because we would like to see numbers and we would like to see improvement in the numbers. And so from experience, the first step, at least what we did, I'm speaking from experience, we identified the pitfalls or the loopholes, the pitfalls or the weaknesses in the chain or in the life cycle. So, and then if we are able to discretize, because right now we just say elementary education, kindergarten and then elementary grade one to grade six. And then we say, okay, junior high school, grade seven to grade 10, senior high school, grade 11 to grade 12. And these are just bulk. But for us, we need to discretize further. Because, for example, uh, from the psychological point of view, kindergarten is very different from grade one to grade three. And between grade three and grade four, there is a transition. And this is observable, especially in how children learn mathematics and science concepts and their approach in answering questions. And then four to six, quite close to grade seven, but we have observed from almost 20 years now in secondary education, there is again a very significant transition between grade eight and grade nine, and then again between grade 10 and grade 11. So there is a reason, for example, why much more, uh, well, more children do very well in math contests, much more in at the elementary level, considering our educational curriculum, 
than in the high school, which is quite rare, although we are now doing well in the IMO. So anyway, so I would suggest more discretization, more um, uh, smaller, and then once we are able to actually discretize, then we assign people to very domain-specific tasks. Uh, that's my uh, proposal from experience. Because I remember, because Professor Pasquale is here in, in management, I think you have this scientific management where they did, at the turn of the century, these time and motion studies. And that was very effective in cutting down costs, costs of production, costs of rendering service. And so we do this um, domain-specific task. And for, for that, um, I think this is a chance because right now, after almost well so many years the DepEd, the department of education is finally uh linking with us in terms of sharing the learning activity sheets that we do in our school school in our dynamic learning program which is very suitable for pandemic conditions even beyond so we focus on independent learning we have we prepare these learning activity sheets but actually, the ones who compose the activity sheets are our regular teachers. And before we are able to share them on the large scale, because when you talk about DepEd, you're talking about millions of school children. And right now, uh, talking about lack of manpower, I am the only one now in the final editing process checking. And if there are gaps, I am filling the loopholes. And when only high school teachers are the one preparing the LAS. You can imagine the lack of maturity in subject matter expertise and in pedagogical strategies. So, let me yeah. make a quick question. In yes. the entire problem, what mm -hmm. do you think is most critical? Is it the lack of uh, equipment, scientific equipment laboratory? Is it no. the materials or is it no. the teacher? Uh, no problem no. what yeah. is the, the no. problem sorry no to all lack of facilities is not a problem we have shown that lack of qualified teachers or training of teachers is not a serious problem uh, lack of internet connectivity lack of electricity lack of phones lack of whatever it's not a serious problem what is the key in our solution which i think the deped will not be sharing it's the composition, the design, the conceptualization, and the implementation or the accomplishment of the what we call as learning activity sheets. These are, well, there are many module, modules and learning uh, resources online, but in our cases, the LAS, that's learning activity sheets, are designed for children to accomplish without any introductory lecture. So teachers only do validation. So the things that people always invoke to get more funding, we are saying no, they are not necessary. You can spend the money on health services. You can spend the money on uh, um, agriculture. But in education, we can do so much even without funds. But what we need would be brain power. And that's why I'm reaching out to Paase retirees um, maybe if you have papers, because for example, in senior high school, they have a subject, um, English for academic and professional purposes. And so they have English used, or academic texts used in agriculture, in the ICT, in the humanities, in the arts, in sports. And of course, if you use text, you have to have, you might have copyright issues of, so if PASI members have, uh, have articles there or papers which you would allow us to use for these specialized courses in senior high school, that would be a big help. And now so one more the, thing. So yeah. it's, it's the curriculum and how the subjects are taught. That yes, is yes. Uh, what we want to focus in. Yes, and, we and, should. And, and there is some good news, as you mentioned, that DevEd is now a little bit more open. La Luna, I think the problem in yeah. DevEd is that they're all uh, teachers and and they they feel threatened when scientists and mathematicians come into the primary and secondary education uh, teaching that is true that is true that's why i had to get my license in teaching so they could <laughs> yeah. at least give me the benefit of a doubt 
but regarding the curriculum also, uh, I, I, I have been always open about this. The shift to the spiral curriculum completely weakened the, well, put our students at risk of very low educational outcomes. And the serious problem there is they had it legislated. It's in the constitution now. It's a part of a Republic Act. Before it used to be discipline based. Well, historically they started, they had discipline based. Discipline based meaning first year high school, you have earth science, second year biology, third year chemistry, fourth year physics. And there are, you could spend one hour lecture for that, why it is so. They shifted to the spiral curriculum in the 70s and early 80s, and then numbers went down. Good and point. so they shifted back to discipline-based, and then now again, they went back to spiral curriculum, legislated it, and now we are all bound to follow it. And that is why personally, I have been having a very difficult time trying to satisfy as a good citizen trying to follow, to comply with the requirements of DEPED, but at the same time, as a scientist, it is so obvious that the weaknesses in mathematics, in science, in the sciences could be traced back to that curriculum. So in fact, personally, I would propose um, uh, decentralization. To, yeah. yeah, no, not okay. really. decentralization, make it optional. No. For we'll those go divisions, to, we'll, yeah. we'll go back to that, uh, that point. And uh, thank you for sharing your, your own experience. And, uh, but at this point, I wanted to segue to, uh, from uh, one educator to the next. And I wanted to hear the comments of Father Ben. If you're, if you're there, Father Ben. Before you came in, Sec Pernia was uh, actually mentioning uh, the need for human capital development and looking at it at a life cycle, at the life cycle ecosystem, even starting with the nutrition of our children, even before they come to school. And I know that this is one of your advocacies as well as science education. So I'll give the floor to Father Ben. And if uh, after Father Ben's lecture, anybody can chime in, just raise your hand in, in Zoom. Father Ben, you have the floor. You are muted. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, well, um, first of all, uh, I agree on many of the points that we have raised already. Uh, before I go to my main point, uh, let me echo my concern, what Marivik said about the spiral curriculum. Uh, uh, it's in a personal battle between my, myself in Ateneo and other educators uh, who insist on the spiral curriculum. Um, we actually, we went back to the discipline in 2000 with Senator Rocco when he was Deputy Secretary because I recommended to him that we go back to the discipline base. But under Brother Armin, I, I actually wrote him that we should stick to the discipline, but Deped, uh decided to go with the spiral. I totally agree with Marie Vick that it is a serious problem. Problem for math, but even more a problem for science. And it's going to set us back uh, years. So anyway, that point is made. Um, I'd like to connect more directly with the recommendations, uh, the possible things we can do that the, Dr. Yusel mentioned and connect it with what we have to do in, in the earlier years, which um, Marivik and Chris have, have raised. I, first, I, I think we have to think much longer term. <laughs> I think one of the big uh, differences between our Philippine culture and say Vietnam or China is, or even Indonesia is they're able to think in 30 year or in China's case, in 100 year terms. They actually have very long planning cycles. No? Um, we cannot seem to think beyond the next election. No? So we think in three year cycles. And you, you cannot do that. <laughs> you cannot do that in this case. So um, I agree with Chris and Mario Dick that we should begin from the beginning. And as you know, um, I keep saying that we can do whatever we wish with our schools, but if 30% of our children are already brain damaged, because of malnutrition in the early years, that's already one third of our population that, that would not be learning. So I do address that, but we are here on the, on the education side. So what I would like to propose as a concrete step um, uh, is to take at least one step down. And then from the proposal of Dr. Giselle about addressing manpower at the MS and, and, and PhD level, uh, to begin at least with high school. <laughs> 
at least in the case of mathematics, uh, mm -hmm. you have to begin at the very, at, at the very uh, least at the high school level. If you don't do it well there, I think you have lost that. Uh, and so I think we have to invest in, in teachers who really can teach mathematics. And I would say the sciences, especially physics well, at the high school level. We cannot do it for all, but we could begin by selecting certain universities uh, and then connecting them with the high school around them and be responsible for training teachers that can really teach a good uh, mathematics and, high, and science program in high school. And one of the biggest challenges is that I would say majority of, of, of Filipino teachers in math are afraid of doing real problems. I know problems is they don't know how to solve themselves. No. They are afraid of taking a problem and going to the class and solving it together with the class. They, they believe that they should know the solutions. No. But that's the difference between a real problem and an exercise. No. We, we do exercises, we don't do real problems. And in physics, as a Japanese friend told me, we do, we do demonstrations, we don't do experiments. We have to have teachers at the high school level who are not afraid of doing problems they don't know and go through the process of solving them. In, in, in other words, uh, if you want to develop people who have potential in mathematics or, or in physics, they have to be, uh, I presume it's the same in chemistry or biology, they have to be able to really solve problems. That is not easy. It's a, it's a framework, it's a way of thinking. And, and that has to be developed. Um, if you compare us with Vietnam, they are very, very good at this. They are very, very, um, I, I, I think we should stop connecting with the US. They're not very good at this except in the elite schools. Uh, we should really look, if you want to look at a country in, in, uh, closer to us, look at Vietnam. Yeah. So that's the first. I, I, there is a real need to invest in high school teachers who can really develop the talent there. It is too late to wait at the MS and PhD level. Why do I insist on this? Because in my own experience uh, of running the uh, consortium, running the uh, SF and Picari and the, 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 CHED, uh, the CHED committee on faculty development, the biggest problem we have about MS and PhD is we simply don't have the stream. We don't have enough people who are prepared for it. Even if we gave out a lot of money, we don't have people who are ready to take it. We don't have the competence level because that competence level has to have been developed at the undergraduate level and has to have been developed at the high school level and ideally as well at the uh, grade school level. I'm not totally sure that I agree with Marie Dick that we don't have to worry about the teachers. Um, I, it, for me, it was a struggle with our own Ateneo high school teachers to really get them to do real problems. Not, not to be afraid to do that. It really was a, a challenge with them to invite them to do the, the problems in the third inter, international mathematics science, science study and learn to do problems like that and to teach it to our students. Um, I'm not so sure that that's so easy. No? Um, I, I don't think you can, you can do that just by following a syllabus. You, you have to, something has to be done in the way to kind of uh, enter into your brain and get you to do that. Uh, so so to, to, uh, to, to summarize, we have to think longer term. I would, if, if, if there was a way that we can really think in at least 20 year terms, which is the time between the time a baby is born and maybe the time that he's kind of in junior, senior college, uh, that would be fantastic. No? And then how do we get our system to not keep changing things, no? uh, so, you know, to, to, to implement seriously. And in the concrete, as I said, um, can we please invest in, not just in MS and PhDs at the research level, but in really very good science and math teachers at the high school and preferably at the grade school level. Um, if you look at China or look at Vietnam, their success owes to these teachers. 
we, we tend to only look at the researchers and the PhDs, but those researchers and the PhDs had very good grades for their high school teachers. Um, I think we should study that cycle. <laughs> we should really study that cycle uh, and, and learn from them. Uh, so that's my main point because and we, we could, I could recommend many, many things, but if we don't address that problem, we'll still be talking about this 20, 30 years from now. It will be the same problem. It, um, it's a little bit like uh, we want to harvest the fruits of a tree, but we don't want to take the trouble of planting it and taking care of it. No? Or we want to have, uh, like a family, we would like to have brilliant children, successful children, but we don't, we're not worried about taking care of them as babies and as teenagers. No? Uh, as a country, I'm not talking about individuals, as a country. Uh, I don't know if we are willing to do that because I don't know whether we have the capacity as a country to think long term. In my own experience of working in science and technology in the country, every time we recommended something, people wanted to know what will be delivered by the time of the next election. If we, can, we have to get out of that short term thinking. We, I would really urge, we have to find a way to get out of that short-term thinking, short thinking. If we cannot do that, then I don't know. You can have all kinds of plans in these meetings, but they cannot be implemented because real good plans can only be implemented over 10, 20 year cycles. Thank you. I'll send back. Thank you, Father Ben. So, so just to summarize again what Father Ben mentioned, these are concrete strategies, number one, Longer term planning is required. If we have, we, we, if we don't have uh, enough funds, then might as well invest in our high school teachers uh, in terms of training. But to me, the glaring contribution of Father Ben this morning is in terms of how we change the mindset of how we teach science and math to our kids. Because like everybody in this in this uh, Zoom room, we were all taught that science and math are exact sciences, that there is a solution to whatever problem is, is provided. And yet we've, we have forgotten that what is more important than receiving the, or uh, attaining the solution at the very end is the process by which we get to that solution. That is what I think was, uh, was uh, missing in how we teach science and math, no? the process. It's okay if you don't know how to solve it at the start, but uh, you are yes, given a yes. set of skills. That is that correct, yes. Father Ben? Na, yes, na we have... than getting the solution at the very end. <coughs> I, yes, I we will... have to do... Yes, go ahead. Uh, as, as, as my friends in Japan and China say, we have to have learn teachers to learn to teach real problems, not just exercises, and real experiments, not just demonstrations. Point taken, Dr. Dr. Father Ben. Uh, may I call on Dr. Coelho, and then followed by Dr. Ernie Pernia. Quick comments from you, Joel. I'll do my best to be quick. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I just want to express my gratitude and uh, appreciation for being part of this discussion. It's a real privilege to be part of, you know, the circle where we have uh, the elder statesman of education and even economics uh, in the Philippines. So uh, I've been away from the Philippines now for 32 years. So of course, what I'm imparting to you is my observations over the years, mainly from afar. And there are advantages to that, but there are also disadvantages to that. And so I'm relying on all of you to correct me if I am off. But I'd like to be candid in my uh, sharing so that hopefully uh, it would be beneficial. And I'd like to go back up higher again in terms of how we view uh, human capital development. Um, I appreciated some of the comments Secretary Pernia said that it has to be comprehensive, you know, from early childhood development all the way to postgraduate. Uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Javier mentioned uh, a mission-oriented uh, uh, research orientation, and Father Nebris, of course, emphasized uh, the importance of long-term planning, which is really essential. Uh, but uh, what I would like to contribute is uh, that uh, 
the uh, human capital development in the Philippines really is not existing in a vacuum, but it's embedded in a certain paradigm, call it the business model, if you will. So back in uh, 2000 to about uh, 2009 or 2010, uh, the president of the Philippines was uh, Gloria Mapagal Arroyo. Uh, these are, I'm reporting this to you, this is not passing any value judgment. Um, so uh, at that time, she was emphasizing the development of uh, personnel and workers in the Philippines for out-migration and for export. And in fact, she was hailing uh, that the greatest export of the Philippines uh, is it's uh, human workers. So that was a particular business model and a particular policy at that time. And, you know, it bore fruit because it really uh, increased the remittances coming into the country. In fact, as of 2019, uh, remittances going into the Philippines accounted for 9.3% of the GDP of the Philippines, and it amounted to about 33.5 billion US dollars. So that's significant. The only question is how much of that goes back into the training of you know, workers and professionals? That's a good question. Uh, but of course, there's a downside to that, which is the dislocation of and disruption of families in the Philippines, uh, because most of the parents were abroad. Uh, so I, my, my take on this is that whether we're aware of it or not, this is still the reigning paradigm for human ca capital development in the Philippines. There is still that mindset, there's still that psychology or, or mind framework uh, that uh, the universities are training uh, these professionals and most of these professionals will be going abroad uh, to, to get lucrative jobs. So I, I submit that that's still the, the reigning uh, paradigm. But I believe, and, and my strong suggestion is that there is a need now to change the paradigm. So I label that paradigm as outward looking, mm -hmm. outward oriented paradigm. It's now time for the Philippines to develop its inward looking paradigm for human capital development. Mm -hmm. And that is to be able to retain them within the country so that they can use their talents to create value within the Philippines, which would then translate into export and so on and so forth. Uh, but the question is, how do you do that? So this really brings to the fore the fact that human capital development is inseparable from economics. Economics and human capital development are intrinsically, inseparably linked and connected. And so this is why it really is important for um, human capital development to be uh, deliberately linked with uh, industries in the Philippines. And Father Nebris emphasized, you know, the Philippine neighbors in, in Southeast Asia. And if you look at all of them, you will see that there is that explicit linkage of human capital development and industry. And part of that industry is driven by the global industry. It's not, it's not native, it's not local, at least at the outset, initially. They were attracting all of these global companies to set up shop in their countries. And explicitly as part of their policy uh, to have this agreement uh, with these companies uh, to be able to help train uh, local scientists and engineers and then to be able to employ them. Uh, so in my heart of hearts, <laughs> that's really what I would like to see happening in the Philippines. Thank you, uh, and, and I would argue, I would argue, last point, I would argue it's not a matter of chicken and egg, because if you look around in the Philippines, there are already global companies in the Philippines. Uh, one case in point is in the uh, electronics uh, sector. It's just a matter really of the government talking with them, negotiating with them, so that they would be hiring, uh, you know, graduates in the Philippines. I think that's negotiable as, as uh, most Southeast Asian countries have, have shown and demonstrated. Thanks, Joel. So uh, uh, a change in paradigm in terms of uh, looking inward instead of looking at the market uh, outside, which we, what we have done so far you know, in the more recent past. Who better to ask about the linkage between economics and uh, human capital development than Sec Ernie himself? Sec Ernie, do you want to chime in? Uh, yes. Uh, a little okay. bit? Let and me... then I'll call on uh, Dr. Advinkula afterwards. Yeah, I, I'll uh, comment on the comments of uh, Joel Coelho and also Father Nebres. And uh, this long-term vision, Father Nebres, uh, actually we have a framework for that already. The long-term vision 2040, what we uh, in Tagalog call 
ambisyon natin. And uh, th- that uh, long-term vision uh, ha- uh, comprises four medium-term development plans meaning four administrations. So if uh, there's continuity from one administration to the next, and there's agreement on what the long-term vision ought to be among the upcoming administration, the current and the upcoming administration, then you'll be able to achieve that. And, uh, you know, just getting your ideas into that long-term vision framework should be easy because it's already, it's already kind of functional. So that's one point. And then another point has to do with uh, the point of uh, Willy Padolina about, uh, uh, I think he, he was talking about getting back or get, attracting more scientists and engineers and uh, uh, S&T workers in the Philippines. Uh, as you know, uh, during my, when I was in NEDA, and the NEDA is in charge of, of uh, the foreign investment negative list. And uh, when I was there, we had to uh, transition from the 10th foreign investment negative list to the 11th uh, FINL. And I made sure that uh, the restrictions, restriction on foreign, fa- uh, foreign faculty, foreign professors, coming into the Philippines be removed from that restriction of the, of the FINF, Foreign Investment Negative List. And so that was, uh, that, uh, that was uh, approved by, with EO 65. And I don't know why UP is still not aware of that. And then that was, uh, that was uh, EO 65 was signed uh, uh, October 28, 2018. This, uh, this uh, uh, morphed into a law in 2019, the Transnational Higher Education Act. And so, you know, uh, hi, uh, that's uh, e, um, RA 11448. 11448. And uh, again, UP doesn't seem to be aware, or many uh, universities still don't seem to be aware of this uh, innovation. <clears throat> so we are really now free to associate ourselves with foreign universities, Philippine universities associating or having uh, agreements with uh, foreign universities and also cross, uh, cross-country uh, uh, migration or you know, visitation of, uh, of professors. And uh, this is what we need because uh, we really need, uh, you know, there's, there's a gap, there's a deficit of uh, these uh, foreign, foreign uh, SNT workers. And thirdly, uh, I would like to also mention that, uh, that? The, um, it has to do with uh, the point of uh, Marivik. And uh, yes, indeed, we should really start with, uh, with the most basic even the child, early childhood development, because uh, we have this problem of uh, 33% stunted children. And uh, as mentioned by Father Nebres, one third of the population, and you are not uh, going to be able to uh, use them for uh, you know, uh, productive schooling if uh, the, that, that problem is not addressed at the earliest. Thank you, Sec. Ernie, which is a good segue to inviting everybody to our third fireside, cha- fireside chat uh, of Paase, which will all be about developing our SNT curriculum and programs at the primary and secondary level so that they all feed into our college uh, and even graduate programs. One thing that uh, doc, Dr. Pernia also mentioned is uh, the role of our universities and even developing our graduate uh, programs. You know, and and um, I wanted to call on Dr. Advincula, who had a vast experience both abroad and now here in the Philippines working with DOST, in terms of what are the strategies, Gobet, that we can take so that we can develop our graduate program uh, as a start. 
Go ahead, go ahead. Thank you so much, CP, and uh, magandang umaga sa inyong lahat. It's about 9.45 p.m. here in the U.S. And uh, I'd like to uh, uh, thank Giselle also for uh, reminding me, alerting me. And most of all, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I really appreciate the opportunity. And, and thank you all. You know, I, I feel like I, I'm with the uh, Hall of Famers <laughs> of Philippines <laughs> interacting with you. But anyway, I'll, I'll give my two cents and I really appreciate all the comments and the uh, wonderful insight experience and also uh, uh, real things, contributions that uh, all our heroes have done here. Uh, my two cents is this, um, it's, it's really uh, a, uh, at this point, it's really we're trying almost everything that was suggested. And with regards to limited resources, of course, they come and go. And uh, like what Father Nebre said, sometimes it really uh, goes from one administration to the other, unfortunately. And we, we all, of course, try to shield that by uh, making the program sustainable. But what I can say from my experience and also uh, uh, suggestion, uh, is that I, I have consistently trained uh, PhD students uh, mostly uh, since 20 years ago. And uh, to my count, about 25 of them, uh, uh, some have returned, uh, um, um, a, number, a good number have returned to the Philippines and uh, uh, some of them stayed here in the US. And in fact, just this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, facilitating the visit of an ERDT fellow uh, to um, University of Tennessee. By the way, I just moved to uh, <laughs> another institution. I, uh, I uh, recently got a governor's chair position at the University of Tennessee and uh, Oak Ridge National Lab. So I don't know how that will go with, in terms of my uh, uh, involvement in the Philippines. Um, but of course, I, uh, I'm committed and I, I hope to uh, continue and uh, in invite more. So the thing is, um, uh, be consistent, have a vision. Um, uh, I have worked with DOST uh, to, um, directly with the, recently with the Additive Manufacturing Center, actually with CP for a while. Uh, we were training together uh, uh, people uh, from the Philippines, uh, different universities on uh, additive manufacturing. But even for a long time, I was hosting a lot of DOST, CHED fellows, ERDT fellows uh, to get their PhD with me. You know, they would stay for a year or sometimes a year and a half to get their research work done. And the key to that was to partner with uh, these different programs, uh, offering my lab as a host institution to accelerate doing research so that they can overcome things like, uh, you know, procurement or a lot of teaching load by giving them that concentrated effort. And, and so far, I would say uh, that has been the key to success to uh, not only them getting PhDs, but also uh, contributing back to the Philippines, getting a lot of publications and training. So I would say uh, when real estate, when they say location, 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 really when we try to incentivize uh, students, uh, to go to higher education, it's market, market, market. And the, the reason I say that is when people invest uh, their time, their talent, and hopefully they get their treasure from a sponsor or the Philippine government, is they want to see a uh, uh, you know light at the end of the tunnel. Ano, ano ba yung employment opportunities nila? And what opportunities will they have when they get their degree? You know, sometimes... Uh, it's really to come to the U.S. to get a degree and maybe stay here. But a number will return to the Philippines because they have to or they want to. But then uh, they have to face the question that, you know, will they be gainfully employed? The basic thing and were there opportunity for advancement? So what I would say is uh, with all the locators coming to the Philippines, companies, uh, with, with the universities uh, at a certain point, uh, there still is a big need, but it will also cap. One of the best ways is really to train uh, our R&D people to be more entrepreneurial. What I mean by that is entrepreneurial in terms of their employers, meaning uh, when they work for a company, be the best to develop new products, 
uh, or, or uh, help develop markets through R&D or uh, incentivize them to start their own companies. Uh, for example, many uh, companies who locate in the Philippines, their uh, need really is not just incentives in terms of taxes, but they're really looking for people to hire or companies to uh, be part of their supply chain. So if we have many uh, business people who will partner with the right R&D people to develop the right product for the supply chain, that could be a good reason to hire the best people who can do R&D. The other is manufacturing, you know. If we, Thanks, uh, go, Robert, sorry. Go, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, I'll be wrapping up soon. Okay. So, you know, what, what my point is, uh, uh, there's uh, enough goodwill, there's the mechanism, there's funding, but uh, at the end of the day, we have to help define the future and employment possibilities for our graduate students. Thanks, Gobet. I think the, the, the main point that I got from uh, you were saying is that if there is no opportunities currently for a master's in, in uh, chemistry or a PhD in chemistry, then you create the environment where they can actually self employ themselves through entrepreneurship. And this is also the point of uh, Dr. Javier earlier of creating uh, centers of excellence, not in terms of the CHED COEs, but in terms of uh, making sure that what, whatever research are able to turn out, that these get commercialized or used by the industry. I'll call on Dr. Yeah. Salvador. So, so can I just make uh, one, one last connection? Yeah, I really uh, appreciate uh, the Bernidos, their commitment to primary and second in dairy education because it really starts there. You know, to, to have a lot of pool for undergraduates to uh, graduates, you really have to start them young. And, you know, a number of us who are products of science high schools, uh, those training, that training at that early age really made a big difference. So my hat's off and, you know, more power to that type of uh, endeavor in our country. Thank you. Thank you. And from all of us, of course, uh, Chris and Marivik, now we appreciate all the effort that you are doing. The other side of uh, using SMT workers in the universities for commercialization and for uh, technopreneurship is actually using them, uh, well, training them at the most basic and fundamental uh, sciences. And this is the point of Dr. Salvador in the Zoom group chat earlier, that there is also that requirement from the industry of these people who have that foundation of, uh, for example, physics or, or chemistry. So I'll call on Dr. Salvador if you're ready, no? but in the meantime, whoever wants to chime in, I'm sure Al has a lot of uh, things to say about uh, strategies, no? concrete strategies that we can take. Um, just raise your hand no, if you want to. Uh, uh, just, a, just a very quick point, uh, CP. Take a sec, Ernie. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I forgot to mention about uh, what uh, uh, Joel Coelho mentioned uh, regarding the inextricable link between uh, industry and uh, government, public and private sector, because we really have to uh, uh, ramp up this public-private partnership because the government really is not able to, uh, to do the right things. I mean, uh, they can only do so much and sometimes uh, wrongly. And uh, the thing about uh, you know, feeding uh, uh, the output of science and technology into the industry, that will further incentivize them into contributing to the Human Development Fund that I was mentioning earlier. Agree. So the, the, the incentive is not just the tax deduction for those uh, for pr public comp private companies uh, provide, uh, contributing to the fund but also this, uh, the, the, the use, what is it for us? So there's something for them in terms of what the uh, SNT can do. Of course, of course. In fact, when you were mentioning that, I'm also, I, no, personally, I wanted to go into another top topic, uh, which is also very uh, interesting uh, personally, and that is strengthening our agriculture research and not just looking at 
industry per se, but agriculture needs to, to get a boost uh, in its arm. And that can be done through R&D. And we've forgotten it because we've all been uh, focused at industrializing, where in fact, agriculture is still our main base. So I'm sure Dr. Javier, Al, eh, Dr. Padulina uh, would, would echo the same thought, you know, that there's that niche that that we can um, that we can uh, pursue yes of course okay. agriculture is part of the industry thank you menchi but what what we are talking about industry is the more high tech industries and we somehow leave behind the agriculture sector CP? thank you uh, go ahead dr salvador okay and, uh, well, quick noble comments. No, um, while we would like to have research done, funded research to be so-called commercialization, uh, I'd like that to be validated because my dealings with the Semicon company is that they would not like to have people trained in that. They always say, we can always outspend you in doing the commercialization. What we need are good people grounded in basic science. Uh, Joel is here. I've dealt with Maxim. They've always asked me, can you give me 10, at least 10 MS? If I do that, my group would be depleted. I've done that with SunPower. I gave my best students to them. But these were already doing their PhD, but I said, it, the, the timing is, is it's, it's bad. We have to support them, otherwise they will leave. I gave my best students to SunPower. I gave my best students to Maxim, but they want 10. And I cannot produce 10 if I would come up with a DOST project that is asking, can you commercialize this in the next two years? And for, the, for these people, that's uh, not what they're after. What they're uh, after is anybody who's good in statistics, we will get them because we need that for our reliability. Anybody who's good in chemistry, no matter what field, we will get them because it's still the basic science. So maybe just to have a revalidation of these things that when we focus so much on our commercialization, let's look at the people that we have. Our people were trained. We have people coming from TIT. We have come, people coming from Japan. I was there in 2009 and I talked to them about the possibility of going back to the Philippines. These are young people. And I told them, look, the salary has gone up. That is attractive for you. The funding has gone up. But when they came home, they said, we're being forced to do something on natural products. That is not our call. So we are being put in a, in a tight spot where apparently there is no, no validation of what the industry needs. Uh, second point, agriculture, uh, Dr. Javier, I think we could work with CHED because when these nicer centers were put up, the initial funding was too small, 50 million. These nicer centers of DUSD, they, they're good in one, uh, inclusivity, it's done outside, most of them are in agriculture, but what we need is really advanced labs, maybe require them to have all of those high school students within that area work in that nicer but 50 million is not going to do. Uh, we, we, the Picari, the funding was something like 150, 100 million. Maybe that's the way to do it because that is the one that will uh, incentivize people, younger ones to say, I'm going to go to the province. I'm not gonna start my career in, in, in Manila because there is a laboratory there. Maybe there's a more value for my life when, when I look at it 60 years down the road. But that's, oh, that's oh, the way. Uh, the funding has to be bigger. And you cannot have yet 12 centers, 24. Don't concentrate in 24 or how many regions we have. Just pick six, six of the best, put all your bet there. And then everybody will be, uh, and just, oh, how did they get that? Because they put their time, they put their effort, the university put the, everything to work there so that the next batch can get the same amount of money. Uh, that's one way of helping the agriculture center. I think the nice is the one that, that will boost the, the R&D centers of that. For the MA, for the secondary, yes, uh, we have realized, no, teachers are bad in high school. So what we have done, at least in cooperation with the US, is finally they have agreed to fund MA, kasi dati MS lang eh. Now, requirement namin sa MA, wag manggaling sa science high school. They have, they have all of that. Kailangan dapat manggaling sa national high school kasi mas malaki teachers. yung coverage. We do not, the, the, the science high school have really good teachers. But if you look at the profile of those who are doing the PhD, they're not coming from the national, from Philippine science. They're not, they're coming from, from the national high school. Uh, maybe because those in Philippine science would like to go to the medical field. 
But there, there is a program point, right point now. Well taken, and we're uh, hoping that Arnel. everybody will take that. No? Now, there's an MA program. Paki blast na lang sa, sa, sa ibang schools. Thank you. That's my point. Point well taken, uh, Arnel, about uh, satisfying the, the need from of the market no? for both. Actually, I don't think they're competing. No, They need these uh, strong uh, people in the fundamentals of physics and math and so on. But there's also that requirement. I'm sure this is what Al wants to say, no? in terms of the need of the industry and technopreneurship and so on. So you have two minutes, Al. Okay, I'm very uh, quick. Thank you very much for all our speakers. Uh, we will be calling on you guys. Uh, I have identified, I have three lead efforts that I've been doing, as you well know, on technology commercialization and technopreneurship. Arnel, I'll have a good conversation with you about the validation in a separate uh, event, I guess. But uh, again, Sec Ernie and I and Joel are all about the ecosystem building to uh, similar to what uh, uh, Dr. Javier has proposed for the Stanford ecosystem. Again, our own localized ecosystem that really works with the right people and the right ingredients. Uh, indeed, on the procurement side, we've been doing this effort on opening it up for scientific equipment for the last six years. President Pascual was part of that effort when we were in UP. USAID Stride has been providing us with support as well for both uh, funding. And I will be calling on, uh, of course, Secretary Willie Padolina has been good, uh, very good uh, inputs on that one. The key is for us to be able to do procurement by objectives for SMT, starting with equipment. That's the main thrust. And the last part is, of course, uh, our effort in being in industry linkages. And again, it all starts with being able to have viable technology base, that's basic research and going into advanced research and going eventually to commercialization and product development. We've been training on this. We have I-Core models that been, we've been using. Uh, U.S. has one six seven billion dollars a year. Uh, they've implemented this program the last 10 years, the Innovation Core. We're replicating it here for the last three years. And we've trained about only 25 companies so far. But eventually, what we will hope is to mimic. They train a thousand companies. They raised over half a billion dollars already on those trained teams. Again, it's team training. I'm not asking scientists to become entrepreneurs. We need to build teams of industry, marketers, and salespeople around the scientists to be able to market the technology. That's the model, not making scientists or members of PAASE become successful entrepreneurs. But in Agree, the process, yeah. the team training will create. So to me, that's it. Uh, I will be yes, calling it's on you. An ecosystem. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's it an, an ecosystem. It's an ecosystem. And the last we need support. To... Correct, correct. So it's ecosystem building support. I'm a supporter of that. On the growth stunting and nutrition, I'm a supporter of that. I'm not going to lead that as well. On STEM education, I'm on, uh, on the board of Unilab STEM. Marivik and Chris, I will try to propose that. And on USAID, there's the, uh, the TESDA project for Tech Walk for second uh, uh, education as well. I will try to help on that uh, okay. as well, but as support. But the lead Thank you. Thank you, Al. Three. Thank you. Thank you, Al. I just wanted to give... Uh, an opportunity for Father Ben. I, I believe Father Ben needs to, to leave already and maybe perhaps you can say a few parting words uh, about the comments that uh, you've heard so far. Go ahead, Father Ben. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so, uh, well, I have to go to another event. Uh, I just want to say that I do agree with all the points being made about commercialization and I've worked in that. But I want to repeat, and I think this was clear from RNL that we just don't have enough people. Uh, uh, as he points out, uh, uh, anybody he has is already absorbed immediately. And, and that really stems from the fact that we have a very weak stream coming from grade schools, high schools, and college. No. Um, I also want to point out that it's very important to work with the, the public school system because um, in studies that have been done in Australia and in the West, traditionally those who go into science and stay with science and math come from the lower middle class. The, as Ardell points out, the, the, the middle, better off middle middle class please in the, in, in, in the Philippine science, uh, many of them will go into medicine and law and business. So it's also a culture thing. And so we really have to invest in, in the stream uh, that, that will feed into the science and, and technology track. So 
anyway, I, I, I've said it often enough, but uh, unfortunately, as I said, we, we haven't really addressed it. And so uh, while all the things that we are planning at the, at the uh, island are, are important, <clears throat> we, when we have to get for government funds, I think the bigger problem is the human capability, the, 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 whether we have the people who can do it. So thank you again. I have to go to another event and appreciate very much this all Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you, Father Ben. And we'll, we're, we'll make sure that we invite you in the next fireside chat thank on you. the primary and secondary. <laughs> yes, thank you, Father Ben. Okay, if, if uh, it is okay with everybody, we will extend our Zoom meeting up to 10.15, so we have uh, 11 more minutes. Um, I believe, uh, sino ba yung nag-raise ng hand kanina? Marivic, yes, of course. Uh, and Joel and I, si, Ino, were you raising your hand earlier? Oh, sige, quickly, Marivic, you wanted to react on uh, something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, quickly, very quickly. Uh, number one, it's always so sad for me to hear that we people keep saying we lack people, we lack human resources. When when we have around, this is a rough estimate again, around 27 million in basic education alone. And so when you're talking about numbers, we have far more numbers than Singapore. And it's really just how we, we educate them. So um, I would also like to, uh, Father Nebres has left. We, I'm happy that we agreed about the discipline-based curriculum. If somebody could sponsor the discipline-based curriculum or if the government wants to maintain the spiral, then at least give freedom to other divisions or other schools to go for the discipline-based, then it would be a big help to help us work with the 27 million young people in our country at present and get returns by within five years or so. And then the next thing that I would like to say, and this is one thing that I disagree respectfully with uh, Father Nebles and with many of you, if we continue to emphasize the training of teachers, ask for budget for the training of teachers, we are dealing with an unstable equilibrium, which means that we might have more trained teachers, but in the end, we lose out because globally, market forces will really overwhelm us. So we have to design programs, and that is what we did with our dynamic learning program. We designed a program which would not be heavily dependent on teachers. Training of teachers is budget intensive, technology intensive, energy intensive, and then they just go out. Only a few would really return. And so we, it's unstable. And so we feel uh, we are scientists, we can innovate, we can design programs that would be not heavily teacher independent, especially now in the 21st century, there's technology, there are just too many online educational resources. Because if we continue emphasizing that, it will be an endless cycle. And there will always be something to blame. Our attitude, Chris and I, for example, we don't want to blame anybody we just want to do something and get numbers, real numbers, and then get a graph that goes up uh, with a stable, uh, stable increasing trends, uh, sustainability, sustainability. So that's all I wanted to do. Uh, okay. The curriculum, then, yes. curriculum, and then teachers. Okay. And then the teachers. Okay, I will di digest all of that. Being a school owner myself, young teacher factor is really it's huge, at least in the traditional sense of how we train our kids. You know, that the teacher factor is very critical. Thank you, Marivy. Joel, you wanted to say something quickly? Yes, yes very quickly. Um, uh, this is pertaining to agriculture in terms of human capacity building. Agriculture remains crucially important for the Philippines because it employs still a little over 25% of all uh, workers in the Philippines. But sadly, it contributes less than 10% to the GDP of the Philippines. So this calls attention to the need to create value, more value within the sector of agriculture. But how do we do that? And how do we promote uh, uh, inclusiveness or inclusivity, inclusivity among the workers in that sector? So one is, and I saw this in Leyte, is 
uh, really to empower the farmers uh, to form uh, associations. Uh, because individual farmers or family-sized farmers, it's going to be very hard for them really to compete in the market. And again, we have to approach this with a market lens because agriculture is a market. Uh, and so <clears throat> we have to empower the Filipino farmers, not just in terms of science and technology, not just in terms of the innovation, which by the way are extremely crucial, but we have to empower them in, in terms of organizing themselves to become competitive entre entrepreneurs and companies. Uh, and this is what I've seen in Leyte. They have farmers associations. The governor helped uh, link them to uh, you know, capital, to training, science and innovation, and more importantly, to market. And so now they really are thriving. Um, yeah. and, and it's a success yeah. story. So, so John creating uh, value in agriculture through R and D. No. We have the yes. we have the experts here in the Zoom room, right. in the person of uh, Dr. Javier, Dr. Eno. Absolutely. So, right. And so the question now is being able to uh, take advantage of Dr. those Martina, innovations. Of Right, taking advantage of the fruit of that world-class R&D and translate it into the marketplace. And, and that really is a matter of, you know, business. It's a matter of learning how to organize themselves as a business. Okay, agree. Dr. Javier or Eno or Dr. Padalina? Doc, uh, Dr. Padalina first, sige. On Commute. Commute po. Yes, um, yeah. First, um, <clears throat> I don't know if we real, realize that the growing impact of online courses is really a threat to the existence of our universities. What if Wharton decreases its tuition fee so that you can very easily get an MBA from them online? And many other opportunities. In fact, if you look at other ASEAN countries, foreign universities are establishing campuses in their particular countries. So that's one. Uh, the, the second point is that um, I think agricultural research should not reside only in the colleges of agriculture. They should, be, they should involve all the other disciplines because at some point you will have borderline issues that will require basic research. For example, if we're looking at flavors and, uh, and essences, you want to know what is the flavor factor, what is the compound responsible for that. I, I'm sorry, but the colleges of agriculture may not be able to respond to that, assign that to a college of science or to a chemistry department. And if you want to look at markets, look at your College of Business Administration. In other words, it, it must involve other disciplines because the, the situation is very complex. You know, uh, you know UPLB is doing that already, Niva. Even if you're uh, in the other departments, you're doing more agri stuff. Yes, already. but you know, as I said, UPLB cannot do it alone. On, on its I own. mean, what are, what are the other state universities and colleges yeah, doing? Yes, yeah. uh, that's true. Yeah, if, if UPLB can be a model, then fine, but they should, the other SOCs should also get into that. Should also and, get into that. Yes. yes. And, and, and lastly, just on the market, and I go back to my suggestion that we get in people. I think even the existing salary scales in our universities, whether they're private or public, should be market driven. Okay. I mean, a college, a dean of a college of medicine should receive a bigger salary than a dean mm -hmm. of uh, something, you know. Yeah. Okay. So, so, otherwise, you will not get the quality that, that you need. So mm -hmm. that's just uh, a few words to, a few thoughts to share. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Pero I think mataas na nga yung sweldo ngayon ng ano? SUC professors and UP. Dr. Ina, were you raising your hand? And then I'll call on Dr. Javier. Really? Yes, I would like to share uh, to the group that uh, what CIS is doing in UPLB. We have been operating for the past uh, 20 years now, the BS in Math Science Teaching. And uh, the idea is to produce uh, quality teachers who will be uh, handling this math and science courses in the high school. 
-hmm. And because of the successes of that particular program, by next year, we are offering also the BS in social science teaching because we notice uh, uh, the distortion on how we teach history and other social studies courses in our uh, high school. So that will be forthcoming. Uh, let me Thanks also react, because uh, you've been discussing interdisciplinarity. Uh, I was a product of that interdisciplinarity program. We call Program on Environmental Science and Management, and uh, Dr. Padalina was also part of that uh, in the late 70s. Uh, the faculty development programs are actually, in the past, have been uh, program-oriented, meaning there is a plan continuing sustainable faculty development program, but it's now missing. And I, I regret to say that because uh, the faculty, the junior faculty is his or on her own uh, seeking for university to accept him. Uh, unlike before where you have the Ford Foundation faculty development program, where you have the ADEB, uh, IDP in Australia. So I, I hope we can, uh, we can uh, follow that program and uh, that will be more successful and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ino. Two final comments from Dr. Pascual. Yeah. It just occurred to me hearing uh, really talk about universities getting redundant, you know. It just occurred to me that perhaps we should not think in terms of uh, the Philippines monopolizing the higher education of Filipinos, because there's so many in our country that we need to educate. In fact, the whole world, the whole developed world is waiting for our people to get trained because we are one of the few countries now producing babies, you know. Uh, if you look at the demographics, we have the youngest profile uh, among the uh, demographics in our region, uh, in Southeast Asia, East Asia, we are the source, we will be the source of manpower. <laughs> then why should we monopolize the development and training, the higher education of our people? Korean universities are waiting for our students. Taiwan universities are waiting for our students. And then there are electronic means of uh, delivering higher education. Let's avail of the, all these uh, possibilities and educate quickly with high quality level of education all our people you know who need to be trained and let us be uh, yeah. the the researchers and scientists in the research institutes that uh, dr uh, emil is talking about we need in to, other countries they should not be educated in the philippines you know okay you know, that, that is actually the strategy of um, is yeah. something we need to pursue i mean it's it's an idea that just occurred to me, hearing uh, what really was talking about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pascual. Yan yung strategy ngayon ng Vietnam, to just send all their students yeah. uh, abroad, and then everyone goes back when uh, their economy is ready. Okay, I think uh, our time is up. I will turn it over to Ma'am Giselle again. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Obviously, kulang na naman yung time, but <laughs> what we are doing differently in the fireside chats is that we are all taking down notes. G Giselle and I are taking down notes and produce it as a paper, a draft paper, which we will circulate to everybody here. Thank you, everyone, and I'll turn it over to Giselle. Thanks, CP. CP has a class at 10, so he's already <laughs> late for his class. 10.15, so 10 -15. I, I leave the, the meeting already. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks so much. So, um, well, just a few uh, parting words. Reminder, we have Fireside Chats every Thursday. And the next one will be uh, on uh, STEM education. And uh, that will be co-hosted with Chris and Marie Vick. And we're hoping to get people like uh, Gani Tapang and Mel Gomez, uh, who are uh, the inventors of uh, Viser. And hopefully also, Chris and Maridik, I will get Toto Oliveira to join us to talk about uh, education in <laughs> biology, okay, and chemistry. Because my own uh, thinking is, while the uh, dynamic learning system works and your LESs work, we're trying to help you develop 
uh, the uh, courses for biology and chemistry, which, which are very experimental and um, uh, empirical. So it starts with observation, which brings me to my point. So uh, one of the centers of innovation in the world is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. Their logo is mens et manus, mind and hands. I would say hands and mind. So I'd like to emphasize that for us to learn science, we need to use our hands. But the hands, of course, are aided now by instruments. Okay? So if you want to teach quantitative science, you need instruments these days. That's why I think there's an opportunity for a visor. I might also invite the UP Engineering Foundation because they're now championing visor. And I'd really hope that you would work closely with Ghani and Mel, your co-graduates of the National Institute of Physics on this, okay? And it starts in early education because in early education, the first uh, uh, pedagogies, the methods are uh, do and tell, show and tell. So do something with your hands, talk about it to, uh, your, to, to your, your classmates and to your teacher. So I think that's so important. But problem also exists in high school and undergrad. The teachers are the ones afraid or incompetent to do the experiments, see? So our fear in visor is even the teachers will not know how to use the instruments. So that's very important. Now, I think uh, on the other, uh, the other end of it, which is the industry end and the applications uh, that are uh, peculiar or unique to our country, I think that uh, what President Javier and um, and um, um, uh, Father Ben Nebris uh, said, find the niches, obviously it would have to be agriculture, aquaculture, marine sciences, fisheries, uh, and um, aided by the new technologies, then you would be able to um, uh, first and foremost solve the, the problem of poverty, hunger, malnutrition, which impacts most, most uh, well, mostly our children, which would be the ones you would have to take care of to produce our uh, productive, efficient workforce, okay? So I think with this, um, I think we've set the stage for, um, uh, well, um, I, many important ideas to uh, write the paper in a way that is attractive and palatable to the people who can help us. And for this, I will really count on uh, Ernie, Bernia, who's already said that he will uh, get his team of uh, economics uh, faculty in the uh, UP Diliman School of Economics to help him. So thank you very much for this very, very stimulating discussion on a most important topic for our national development. Thank you and uh, good night. And thank you all. Especially to our participants from the United States. Thank you. <laughs>